Welcome everyone to this educational webinar on clinical trials. I'm Ben Shaberman, Senior Director of Scientific Outreach at the Foundation Fighting Blindness, and I'll be providing an overview of clinical trials, especially as they relate to emerging therapies for inherited retinal diseases. I'll be giving you a basic definition of a clinical trial. We'll talk about the phases, some of the challenges of launching trials, and we'll spend a considerable amount of time on clinical trial design as well. But most of the concepts are pretty basic, so you don't have to have a deep science background to uh, benefit from this educational webinar. So let's get started. Let's talk about the basic definition of a clinical trial. And the basic definition is it is research, in most cases, for an emerging treatment in humans. And the, the key words here are research. It is a research study and it is for a potential or again, an emerging treatment. Something is not yet a treatment when it's in a trial. I think that's important for people to understand because um, participants obviously hope that they will benefit from being in a clinical trial. There'll be some um, benefit to their vision, maybe vision saved or restored, and that could happen. But in a trial, the investigator, investigators are still learning about the safety and efficacy of this emerging therapy. So I always use the qualifiers emerging and potential when we're talking about treatments in trials. And I think in, uh, another very important point for people to understand is that many therapies and trials will not get FDA approval ultimately. They will not pass through the whole process and get approved by the FDA. This is just the nature of clinical research. That doesn't mean we don't learn something from the clinical trial. That doesn't mean that a therapy developer can't come back with a new formulation or a new um, way to administer the therapy that might be successful. But this underscores the fact that trials are research. So for those of you interested in clinical trials, I think it's very important to understand and um, set your expectations for what could happen in the trial. And if you do inquire about a trial, it's incumbent upon the investigators to really un help you understand what the risks and expectations are. So let's talk about the general goals of the trial. And these are, are pretty obvious. Number one, the, 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 the number one goal, first and foremost, is to demonstrate that the treatment is safe that it does no harm. That's what's most critical to the regulatory agents, agencies like the FDA and the European Medicines Agency. Again, making, making sure the treatment is safe. Secondly, you want the treatment to be effective and better than an existing treatment. So in our world of inherited retinal diseases, we really have just one FDA approved therapy. So most therapies in development right now are better than what we have because we don't have a whole lot. But if you were developing a blood pressure, a new blood pressure medication, because there are a lot on the market, you would need to do something better, make it more effective or convenient to um, get the FDA to approve it. And ultimately, therapy developers are seeking regulatory approval when they're launching a clinical trial. That's the whole point, is to get approval from the FDA or the European Medicines Agency in Europe so that they can market the treatment to the people who need it. Now, an important aspect of getting a trial off the ground is for the therapy developer to, to submit what's called an investigational new drug application. It's also referred to often as an IND. If you listen to companies and researchers, you often hear about the IND process. That's a very um, intensive process. There's a lot of preclinical work that goes into submitting the IND. There are many conversations that therapy developers have with the FDA pre-IND submission. And once that application is submitted, the hope is 
after 30 days, you don't get any comments back from the FDA. And that means they've authorized your clinical trial and you can move forward. They may request additional documentation or a little more research. But again, the hope is that um, your IND will be um, accepted, authorized without further work. So launching a clinical trial, moving a treatment out of a lab into the clinic is challenging. And one of the big reasons why it's so challenging is the work that's done in animal models and lab studies is um, adheres to a different standard than the work we do in humans. The level of quality of the treatment, of the procedures, the documentation is all at a different level when you're starting to move something um, into a human trial. And the regulatory bodies like the FDA and the EMA are not involved in monitoring <laughs> the lab research they're heavily involved in monitoring the clinical trials. So that really raises the bar for what therapy developers have to, have to um, uh, do to make sure their trial is successful. And there's, there's a lot of risk. I've already mentioned that a lot of clinical trials don't ultimately lead to therapies. So whatever investment is made, is a somewhat, is an investment that has some risk associated with it. The companies and researchers who are launching trials need a lot of expertise in drug development, clinical trial design. They have to understand the FDA. And then of course they have to um, raise money to um, uh, advance something into a clinical trial. So crossing this chasm as we call it, is often referred to as crossing the valley of death, at least when you talk to pundits in the biotech and pharmaceutical industries, because a lot of treatments don't make it out of the lab and into clinical trials. It's a, it's a tough chasm to cross. So to cross this chasm, to cross the valley of death, as I've already indicated, you need knowledge of the FDA and understand what their expectations are. Are, you need to be able to develop a clinical grade of the drug or biologic that you're going to use in the clinical trial. That's a much higher grade of the treatment than you use in a lab or animal study. You need to be able to launch a company to manage the process and also raise money. And again, you have to have some willingness to take risk with your investment because again, everything's not going to cross the finish line. Now, the Foundation Fighting Blindness is actually addressing this challenge on a number of fronts, but two primary fun, fronts. One is through our Retinal Degeneration Fund, which is a venture philanthropy fund to help companies clinically develop their therapies. We're investing in partnership with other entities, may, maybe venture capital firms or other partners, to help move therapies into early stage and through early stage clinical trials. So that's helping considerably with the translational process. And through a, a different program called our Translational Research Acceleration Program or TRAP program, we're helping academic researchers um, do the work they need to get close to the IND process. So they can become perhaps ready for the RD fund investment or an investment by another outside firm. So let's discuss next the phases of clinical trials. And before we talk about the clinical trial phases, I wanna make the point that there's a lot of preclinical research that goes on before you're ready for your human studies. And that research can, that preclinical research can take a number of years, depending on what point you're at in deciding to move a therapy forward. Do you have animal models? Do you have a previous ex experience developing a therapy? How, how often do you have to iterate in the animal models? Do you feel like you've gotten it right? But that could take several years, five, maybe 10 years, depending on um, the project. And these studies cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and sometimes more. And then once you're ready to start the trial, that translational research to actually 
um, move the treatment into the clinical trial requires what we call some translational investments. And those are safety and toxicology studies in larger animal models. And those cost a few, can cost perhaps a couple or a few million dollars. So once you get to that point and your IND is authorized, then you're ready for the clinical trial. And again, the different phases. Now, a lot of times the phases one, two, and three are actually combined. Phase one is combined with phase two. Phase two is combined with phase three. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of um, each permutation, but primarily at the early stage, at a phase one or a phase one, two, we're focused on safety. That's the most important aspect of the trial. And typically in our world of inherited retinal diseases, we're looking at safety in perhaps a dozen, maybe two dozen patients. If we're also looking for an efficacy signal and we're doing safety in people that actually have the disease, we'll also be looking for early signs of efficacy, though they won't necessarily be paramount to move forward. But once we move into a full phase two, or perhaps a phase two, three, then we're, we're making an earnest attempt to see if there's efficacy. Continue to look at safety. We're looking at safety throughout the process. But at phase two, you're going to start getting into perhaps dozens of patients, maybe 100 patients if it's a larger indication. And you'll also continue to look at different levels of dosing. You might look at dosing in phases one slash two, as well as a phase two or phase two slash three. And the idea is to find the optimal dose, um, the safe dose that provides an op optimal um, result. So if you get through a phase two and you're so, showing some good signs of efficacy and you have the money, then you can start the phase three trial. And we call that the, the pivotal uh, phase. So a phase three or a fa phase two slash three, depending on, on um, your actual trial, is where we're looking for an, a, a very strong efficacy signal. In our world, obviously, that's the saving and or restoring of vision. And an important aspect of a phase three or a pivotal trial is you want multiple centers to replicate the results of the trial. That really reinforces that your therapy works, that you have investigators in different clinical settings that are using the same protocols and equipment, but are getting the same results. So the multi-center aspect is important for a phase three. This is also going to include your largest cohort of patients. And you obviously need a strong efficacy signal coming out of phase three. And if you get that, then you can go to the FDA or the EMA and submit a new drug application or a BLA, which we'll talk about um, a little later. Finally, if you want, you're still interested in learning more about your product after it's been FDA approved, you can do that in a phase four trial. So what does the FDA need to approve a treatment and before that get the clinical trial off the ground? Well, you generally need to show safety and efficacy in a couple of animal models in general. Um, I would say that's the case. Now, often you have to do a toxicology and safety study just before you launch the trial to ensure um, or at least greatly reduce the risk that the treatment will be safe and um, well tolerated in humans. So that's what those large animal tox and safety studies are all about. And when you're working with the FDA on your trial design, you need to find viable endpoints to ensure that you can demonstrate that the treatment is working to save or restore vision. That may sound simple, but it's not. And for many, uh, the reason for that is for many of our diseases like RP, a lot of the typical tests that are run in a doctor's office that you, you might take to monitor your vision, something like an eye chart or visual field are not very sensitive. There's a lot of variation and they may not change a lot over time. So it's been incumbent upon investigators in our world to come up with more um, precise and um, 
objective measures of vision change and um, changes in retinal structure. A mobility course is an example of that. And we'll be talking more about that in a few slides. But I think that's an important thing to emphasize. And we'll be talking about more aspects of clinical trial design, choosing the right participants, the right centers, the right treatment, and so on. But an important aspect of conducting a clinical trial is to report on any and all adverse events. It's a big part of a clinical trial is documentation and monitoring, and really not just of the adverse events, but just all the patient visits and tests. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it's important that the, the therapy developer be able to develop a therapy that's of a very high standard in safety for um, study in humans. And, you, and we do this by following what's called good manufacturing practices. Those can be challenging, especially when you're developing something like a gene therapy or a stem cell therapy to ensure that the therapy is safe and effective and consistent. But um, thus far in clinical trials, uh, most therapy developers have been doing a good job of that. So moving on to, again, clinical trial design, First, let's talk about finding the right participants. And I think it's important for us to remember that for most of us with inherited retinal diseases, our conditions are rare. They're not very common. So it can be challenging finding people to recruit for clinical trials. And the Foundation Fighting Blindness is addressing this challenge in part by offering no cost genetic testing, genetic counseling, and a patient registry. Because if you can help patients get genetically screened, identify the mutated gene that's causing their disease, and get them in a registry, then companies who are accessing the registry know that they're available for clinical trials. And while not all clinical trials will require that you know your genetic profile, many will, and even if they don't, it can be helpful if you have that information and you're in the registry and you can get on the radar screen of these um, therapy developers. Now there are other benefits to the no cost genetic testing program. It really helps patients and families understand and manage their IRDs, but a big draw for both patients and families and the therapy developers is getting them in the clinical trial pipeline, getting them on the radar screen. And I wanted to talk a little more about the My Retina Tracker registry to help you understand why it's important. And first of all, you can access the My Retina Tracker registry at myretinatracker.org. It's free, it's highly secure. You as the patient or the family member control the record. It's been designed for ease of use, whether you have good vision or not, if you use a screen reader, most of the information you enter is entered through pull down menus to make it easy and minimize mistakes. And your, and your privacy is always protected. Um, when recruitment is going on for clinical trials, they don't get your personal information. When you come up on their search, they get an alphanumeric identifier that's given to FFB. We then contact you and let you know that you match the criteria and then it's up to you to contact the therapy developer um, and let them know that you're interested in being in their trial. But an important thing to remember about my retina tracker is while it's great if you've been genetically tested or you know your mutated gene, you don't have to have a genetic test. You don't have to know your mutated gene to be on the registry. But this is a great way, not the only way, but it's a great way to get on the radar screen of um, clinical trial recruiters and therapy developers. So in addition to finding the right patients, it's important that we work with and identify the right clinical trial centers. The bottom line is a clinical trial center is a little different from your typical doctor's office. These centers have expertise in research. They have people that are researchers, they have um, more extensive equipment and protocols 
for conducting um, tests that are more frequently done in research. And they understand the rigors of clinical trials, all the data collection and reporting. And actually the Foundation Fighting Blindness has what we call a clinical consortium of different centers around the world that are well equipped to conduct clinical trials. And by maintaining this consortium, we're in good position to launch clinical trials more quickly. Now these centers will often help in clinical trial recruitment. And again, they have the more extensive equipment and the knowledgeable personnel um, for doing these research studies, these clinical trials. So another challenge in conducting a clinical trial is making the trial the right duration. As most of us know, inherited retinal diseases tend to progress pretty slowly and the year-to-year -year changes aren't that dramatic. They can be hard to measure objectively. So you need to design a trial that um, can capture changes in vision over a relatively short amount of time. We can't conduct clinical trials for several years, for decades, because it just isn't affordable. So we need to design trials that are short enough that they're affordable, but they're long enough that you can capture some changes in vision and show that the therapy is actually working, that it has some efficacy. So one of the way, ways we do that is by choosing innovative and um, powerful outcome measures. We'll be again talking about that um, shortly. But just to give you a sense of the cost of a clinical trial, I would say most clinical trials in our space will cost at least $100 million. And in many cases, it will be more. Um, that may depend on the duration of the trial and how many patients you're observing and, and some of the other um, aspects of, of the clinical trial design. But I think it's safe to say in most cases, they'll easily be $100 million in total. So it may sound obvious that you need the right treatment um, when you move into a trial, but this can be a challenge in determining what that treatment should be. Investigators are constantly trying to come up with better and better treatments, better formulations, better ways to administer the treatment. But once you decide to move into a trial, you have to put a stake in the ground because once you move that treatment into a human study, you can't change the formulation or the procedure very dramatically, if at all. So at a certain point, the therapy developer has to say, this is what we're going to move into the trial. And determining the delivery me method, where in the retina you're going to administer it, or perhaps it's something you want to deliver orally or as an eye drop. All of these decisions have to be made before you move into the clinic. Because again, once you're into the clinic, clinic you're pretty much locked in. And while you will um, do some dose ranging studies in the clinical trial, you really want to start off with a pretty good sense of what your dosing should be, or at least what that range will be. And then obviously, in developing a treatment, you have to think about who's it going to help. Do you need patients with a certain genetic profile? Are they available? What stage of vision loss is your treatment going to, to benefit, um, be of most benefit um, to patients? So a lot of decision-making that needs to go in when determining exactly what treatment you're, and what formulation you're gonna move into the clinic. And then yet, yet again, I wanna come back to outcome measures and how important they are. As I said, things like visual acuity or visual field that are often taken in a doctor's office are not very sensitive. They can vary actually pretty dramatically day to day. So the Foundation Fighting Blindness has actually addressed this challenge head on um, to come up with more objective, sensitive outcome measures. And we've done this through, in part, by natural history studies of different diseases, like our Progstar study for Stargardt disease, our Rush 2A study for people with Usher syndrome type 2 and RP, 
our EYS study for people with RP, and by tracking people over time, measuring changes in their vision and their um, changes in visual structure, we're better able to identify outcome measures that are going to be, again, sensitive and objective in, um, in clinical trials. And actually, from several years ago, a study of valproic acid that some of you may be um, familiar with, we developed a, an outcome measure known as easy area, which has turned out to be a very valuable measure and um, something that's being accepted by the FDA. And in short, easy area measures the viable volume of photoreceptors in the retina. And you can measure this using optical coherence tomography. That's what the image is on the bottom of um, this slide. And the, in this slide or this image, the arrows are um, showing the boundaries of the viable photoreceptors. And while vision measurements may change um, or, or not be that sensitive over time, this easy area is a much more sensitive, reliable measure. And the FDA has said that they're um, um, accepting this as a surrogate measure for changes in vision. So you'll see more and more use of easy area in clinical trials and hopefully more um, outcome measures that can be powerful, sensitive, and objective. So once you get through your clinical trial process, you obviously designed it based on all the things we've talked about. Hopefully your treatment has been safe and effective. You've gotten through your phase three. Then you go to the FDA and submit what's called a new drug application if it's a molecule or a biologic license application if it's something like a gene therapy or stem cell therapy. And this document will contain all the meticulously co collected data that um, you got in conducting your clinical trial. These documents are huge. They're usually 100,000 pages or more. And the review process is not trivial. It generally takes several months. And the FDA or EMA can always come back and ask for additional data and even ask you to conduct an additional study if they think there's something missing, some kind of gap that needs to be filled. But hopefully after NDA or BLA submission, after those many months, um, you as a therapy developer would get approval. So the great news in our space of inherited retinal diseases, and I'm presenting this as of January, 2021, there are more than 40 clinical trials underway um, for therapies for inherited retinal diseases. So there's been a tremendous surge in human research in clinical trials over the last, um, I would say decade or so, and that number will continue to increase impressively. And I think it's important, while this number sounds impressive, as I said at the beginning of this um, webinar, a lot of therapies in clinical trials aren't gonna make it across the finish line. And that makes it incumbent upon us to launch as many um, clinical trials as possible, to make as many shots on goal as possible so we can get more therapies across the finish line. And the good news is we do have several therapies right now in phase three or soon moving into phase three. So I think we're in good pos position in the next um, couple of years, let's say, to get more therapies across the finish line. If you wanna learn more about clinical trials, you can go to the foundation's website, fightingblindness.org. We have many articles on ongoing trials and new trials. And you can also go to the um, clinicaltrials.gov website hosted by the National Institutes of Health, which has all the clinical trials underway in the US and many overseas. So thank you for taking a little time to learn about clinical trials and best wishes moving forward. Thank you.